Digestive problems are probably in the top three most common issues I see in my patient base. And if you've watched my videos, you know that I got into Chinese medicine because of my own digestive problems. But in this video, I thought I would enhance and embellish and speak more on this idea of spleen chi deficiency being one of the most common digestive patterns that I see and three different little subclasses or similar patterns to spleen chi deficiency because it's very, very common. And these are the three most common GI patterns that I see. Hey guys, Dr. Alex Hine, author of the health book, Master of the Day and Doctor of Chinese Medicine. So before we jump into this video, there are two important links right below. The first is if you'd like to become a patient of mine locally in Los Angeles or virtually via telemedicine, you can reach out and contact my private practice that way. And there's also a free guide, which is four daily rituals that could potentially help you add years to your life with Chinese medicine. So let's talk about these three patterns of spleen chi deficiency. So the general spleen chi deficiency pattern is really kind of a pancreatic enzyme deficiency in layman's terms. Because what do these people experience? Typically, lack of appetite, often pale face, often more on the anemia side of the spectrum, or certainly look that way, bloating, either constipation, but not really hard stools. They're often irregular or soft when they come out, sometimes soft diarrhea stools, liquid stools, bloating, food sensitivities is very, very common, sensitive stomach, picky eaters. All of this really falls into that pattern of spleen chi deficiency. Now, that's a very common pattern by itself. Food allergies and SIBO are big, big issues I see in a lot of people today. And that's not the only pattern, though, that I see. That's kind of my pattern. But there are two others that I think are important to know. The second one is called spleen yang deficiency. Now, in spleen yang deficiency, basically what we see more of is more abdominal pain and looser stools. So spleen yang deficient people basically will feel cold, tends towards pain, and will have much looser stools. So what is the most common scenario that I see is people say, my stools are always kind of on the verge of diarrhea, or there's undigested food, or they're having many loose bowel movements throughout the day. The most severe being, for example, ulcerative colitis, which is not just spleen yang. You know, there's not just diarrhea 20 times a day, there's blood and there's pus, and it's really severe. But in terms of spleen yang deficiency, person feels cold. So the actual immune healing force, so to speak, quote unquote, is depleted to the point where their body cannot recover. And much more frequent stools and often pain. And the third pattern here that I see is, let's just call liver gallbladder constraint and spleen chi deficiency. So now what we see is more liver gallbladder involvement, which commonly manifests in two or three ways. Most commonly, some kind of stomach dysfunction, i.e. reflux, burping, indigestion, a lot of mucus in the throat, but very often acid reflux indigestion picture is some liver or gallbladder involvement. The second way it shows up is in the stools. So alternating bowel movements, hard and soft, sometimes hard at the start, then soft, varying pebbles, and then some days diarrhea in our stools. That's more of that liver gallbladder pattern. And then for women, varying menses or menstrual regularities or painful menses or variable menses, all of that can fall into this pattern as well. So the difference here is that there's not just a lower GI pattern of bloating the food baby. The food baby is kind of the archetypal spleen chi deficiency pattern. But on top of that, there's some dysfunction going on with the stomach, for sure. There's usually reflux going on here. People will often say they get burning or acid reflux, that kind of thing. So these kind of patterns are almost three grades of the same thing. Because one, spleen chi deficiency can be pushed into spleen yang deficiency or Commonly, people with spleen chi deficiency that then don't eat well, don't eat good diets, and they have that genetic template, then we have the saying that an excess of chi becomes heat. Now, a simple explanation is, in layman's terms, if you continue to eat, overeat, eventually you produce too much congestion, right? Overeating basically harms the stomach. When you continually do that, for many of people, what they'll experience is some signs of sourness or bitterness in the mouth. From our experience, that is where the liver and the gallbladder begins to get involved. That is where there are beginnings of gallbladder problems, where even someone who eats a good diet, if their spleen chi is really, really weak, the enzymes are really, really weak, what happens is that if they're not careful and they still eat a crappy diet, then they can begin to have gallbladder problems. And some people, even if they eat a healthy diet, uh, will have gallbladder problems if they have severe spleen chi deficiency anyway. So these are almost a progression in many ways, but I think they're useful to know because I see all three of them on a weekly or a monthly basis. It's very useful, very interesting to know. 
And sometimes just by knowing what's going on, it can produce a little bit more calm and a little more sense of security. But three common GI patterns, spleen chi, spleen yang, liver, gallbladder, and spleen that we see commonly in Chinese medicine that are worth knowing because they are really degrees of severity in many ways too. That's all I've got for you today, guys. If there's anything else you'd like to see on dietary stuff, just comment below and let me know, all right? I need some new ideas for you and I'll shoot whatever is the most interesting or the most appealing. And otherwise, watch these two related videos here, more on the spleen chi diet.